Tinakoto Katoa, Ko Sharon Tokoingua, Mai Mai Haere Mai. In keeping with the traditional welcome of the Indigenous people of Aotearoa, New Zealand, I am pleased to welcome Taiha Hawk, Kotaki of Ngāti Whātua Oraki. Here in New Zealand, it is Mahuru Māori, Māori Language Month, and Taiha will be welcoming us in Te Reo Māori today. Nō reo, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, te he wā muri ora ki te whaiau, ki te omarama. Uh, Whakarongo e ake au ki te tangi a te manu tui, 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 tui a. Tui a ki runga, tui a ki raro, tui a ki roto, tui a ki waho. Tuia ki te rere tangata, ka ranga te pō, ka rongo te ao. Tuia ki te kawai tangata, tā ki a mai, i hawai ki nui, i hawai ki roa, hawai ki pā māmā, te hono ki wairua ki te whaia, te au marama, mawiri ora. E ngā mana, e ngā iwi, e ngā reo, ngā tō pito katoa te ao, e nei, Reo a whātu, a whātu arangi, whātu a ki uta, whātu ki ki tai tau, te ki mai, a whātu a nukua ki nei tangi nei ki a koutou, nau mai, rama ira, rama ira ki irungi i tēnei reo, te reo i waiho te amai, e ngā mātua e ngā tūpuna, ki a tau nei koutou, ki runga, i ngā tai, e whā, o ao te aroa nei, E mihi nei, e tangi nei ki a koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā rā, koutou katoa. Tēnei ka mihi ki a koutou, ngā tua wahine o te aoha kina kina. A koutou a kumanu mā rei kura. A koutou rā ku wahine toa. Koutou rā te uri o rātou ngā wahine toka i te ora i rote i ngā whare, i runga i ngā kāinga. Ki rungi ngā marae, pita noa, i te ao, tēnei ka mihi atu ki a koutou, ngā waihotanga, a te hā o hene a hune, tēnei ka mihi, tēnā katangi, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā rā tātou koutou. A tēnei ka mihi ki a koe, e Rachel, Secretary of the International Working Group, ki a koe anō hoki, a e te minita, E Grant Robertson no te whare pare mata o Aotearoa nei. Tai o tu nai rā ki a koe Her Excellency, the Australian High Commissioner to New Zealand. Kei aku rangatira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, a tēnā rā tātou katoa. A tēnei mihi, a he mihi poto, a hako e toru toru nui ho ngā kōrero, he mihi aroha nui ki a koutou, nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā rā tātou katoa. Papa ki mai, ngā ngaru nunui, wā waratia, ngā tai rere, e ipo e ngā ngaru nunui, te rehuta e hei ko nei rā. A piti hono tātai hono, rātou te hunga wairue ki a rātou, a piti hono tātai hono. Tātou ngā waiho tango ngā mātua ngā tūpuna ki a tātou. Kei raro i tēnei whare kōrero o ngā wahine hā ki nā kino o te ao. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Tēnā rā tātou katoa. Kia ora taiha, nā mihi kia koe. Beautiful. Thank you very much. I also welcome and acknowledge the Honourable Grant Robertson, Australian High Commissioner, Her Excellency, the Honourable Patricia Forsyth. Kia ora, my name is Sharon Lloyd, General Manager of The Circle here in New Zealand. We are humbled and extremely excited to be joined by over 600 guests from around the world. Hello, g'day, bonjour, tūmi lama, ola, bula, mai chi, namaste, shalom, konnichiwa, chi kaiti, and kia ora to all of you. Thank you for joining us today. The impacts of COVID-19 are being felt harder by women and girls in many areas of life, including, of course, sport and recreation. The Circle, through our Sports Connect platform, is pleased to provide a forum for connectivity and positive conversations around gender equity and sport. We are extremely proud of our partnership with Women in Sport Aotearoa, and in particular for this special event today. 
I want to acknowledge CEO Rachel Froggatt, co-chairs Julie Patterson and Sarah Lieberman for the important and tireless work you do for your community. To our speakers today, thank you for your time for being with us and you'll be formally welcomed shortly. The housekeeping for today, please note that this virtual luncheon is on the record. We welcome the media with us and we also encourage questions from our attendees. You can submit these through the Q&A function and Melody, our moderator, will pick them up later on. It is now my pleasure to introduce the Honourable Grant Robertson, Minister of Finance, Minister for Sport and Recreation, Minister Responsible for the Earthquake Commission, Associate Minister for Arts, Culture and Heritage, and MP for Wellington Central here in New Zealand. Minister Robertson leads the government's work to lift the value and visibility of women in sport and pledge to make women and girls his number one priority in his sport and recreation portfolio. Minister, thank you for being here with us today and I'll now hand over to you. Kia ora. Uh, nā mihi nui ki koutou katoa, uh, ena mana whenua uh, ki tēnei rohi Ngāti Whātou o Ōraki, uh, kei te mihi, kei te mihi, kei te mihi. Uh, tēnā koe i taiaha, uh, nā mihi nui ki koutou katoa, uh, ena rangatira mā ana hoe whā, a uh, tēnā koutou, a uh, tēnā koutou, a uh, tēnā tātou katoa. Uh, greetings everybody, uh, thank you Sharon. Uh, I want to acknowledge again Ngāti Whātua uh, for their warm welcome and taiaha for your uh, mihi to us today. Uh, for those joining us from around the world, uh, the relationship that has been built, I think, over time between uh, WISPA, the International Working Group, and our, our local mana whenua, the people of, of the land of Auckland, uh, Ngāti Whātua or Ōraki, I, I say thank you again for that, and I think it is a very special part of the relationship which we hope to see uh, build and build through until May 2022. Sharon, can I thank you and the Trans-Tasman Business Circle for once again uh, being such a strong supporter of, of this work. Uh, this is a very different captain's lunch to start with. I haven't had any lunch uh, so far uh, today, but I'm sure that'll happen eventually. Um, and, and, you know, please all hold back from sending Uber Eats into, into Parliament uh, in the short term. I will get a hold of something soon. But it is a very, very different lunch and one that uh, I, I'm really pleased we've been able to go through with. I'm really looking forward to the conversations uh, that we're uh, going to see, uh, hear rather, and see over over the next hour and a half or so, just because I think um, that will be of much value, if not more value than anything I might be um, able to impart in the next few minutes. Uh, to the whole team um, at WISPA and to those working on the International Working Group, um, to Rachel um, in particular, um, thank you so much for the work that you're doing. This really is a very, very difficult time for anybody trying to think about organising international events. Uh, and so the challenges have been met incredibly well. I'm proud that the government has continued to uh, support you in that and provide resources to, to help keep going over this really challenging and difficult um, period of time. Um, and I really also want to acknowledge the, the wider team within WISPA. I'm not sure if my parliamentary colleague, Louisa Wall, is on the call. I'm sure she is. And so I want to acknowledge Louisa here as well, um, along with um, um, Her Excellency, the High Commissioner for Australia, um, building on, on our partnerships. And perhaps that's where I, I might start is as I think about where we are now from last year's lunch, one of the really significant things that I'm very proud of from a government point of view is the successful bid to host the FIFA 2023 Women's World Cup in Australia and New Zealand. Um, as most of you on the call will be well aware, trans-Tasman rivalry is, uh, is alive and well. Um, the business circle brings us together, but so has sport in this case. And that joint bid was one that was um, developed very strongly with the co-papa, the, the ethos of, of what WISPA and the IWG are about built behind them. This is a massive opportunity for us to highlight not only some fantastic athletes and some top-notch football, but also the importance of valuing and the increasing the visibility of women in sport um, for girls, young boys and the rest of the population as well to be able to see that in New Zealand in 2023. And it will come off the back of what will now be three events in three years in New Zealand. Firstly, this year in 20, sorry, next year in 2021, uh, the um, 
Women's Rugby World Cup, and now the delayed uh, uh, event, which is the um, ICC Women's Cricket World Cup as well, which will now take place uh, in 2022. That represents three high-level elite events and housed in the middle of all of that is the hosting of the International Working Group in May 2022. For me, that is exactly the kind of commitment as a country that we should be showing to women's sport, and it's my commitment still as the Minister of Sport to continue to support and enhance those elite level events uh, to make sure that we have got things to look forward to, uh, but also uh, events that are, are about continuing to build a strong legacy and a strong sense of pride in the achievements of our elite female uh, athletes. In terms of where we are as a government, um, as has been stated by Sharon, we, we said right at the beginning, uh, I made women and girls in sport uh, my number one priority, and we've been rolling out the strategy through the work of Sport New Zealand and High Performance Sport New Zealand on that. Um, we've just recently seen uh, the celebration around the coaching initiative, which is a little bit over $2 million put in place to support uh, elite level uh, coaches within our system. Uh, we have far too few elite level female coaches and they are concentrated in particular sports uh, and so this is an attempt by us to be able to to push out with support for that and it's been a very successful program and I'm delighted to see uh, people coming through that. We've seen the activation funds uh, that we've been working on uh, for some time start to roll out to start drive some of the innovation in our sport uh, as well um, that will highlight the role of women and young girls in sport. So those programs are rolling out and that strategy continues to be tweaked and developed uh, as we go. But obviously in the midst of all of this, COVID-19 has arrived and all countries around the world have been grappling with it. Uh, it is the, you know, a, an enormous global pandemic. It is an economic crisis, but it is also creating um, significant strain in our communities and as a social uh, crisis as well. For us, it has been incredibly important that we continue to support sport and that we continue to support active recreation in our country through this time. And so as a government, we put forward around $260 million worth of support over the next couple of years to not only help sports, sports organisations, clubs, uh, recreation organisations to respond in the immediate term and continue, continue to play the really critical role that they play in our communities, but also look to the future and the recovery and the rebuild of sport and recreation. And we've split our funding into three along those three different uh, stages. The response funding has seen money go to clubs and to organisations and to keep going with uh, not only at a professional level, and we've seen support right across um, our big and major sports in that regard, but also all the way through national sporting organisations and down to glass, grassroots club level to be able to see those continue. Sporting clubs and sporting organisations are about bringing people together. Physical distancing has made that very, very hard, but their role remains more important than ever. And I've heard numerous stories of sports and recreation clubs being at the centre of efforts to support their communities to get through this, not just in terms of organised activities, but reaching out to make sure the mental health and well-being, the physical well-being of our people and the members of those clubs uh, are continued to be upheld. We're incredibly uh, excited about the next phases of our support program, which are about looking to rebuild stronger and better. And the role of women and girls in sport is again at the centre of that. I made clear to Sport New Zealand that in all parts of the response, recovery and rebuild, our strategy needs to be a front and centre. And so we are looking towards innovative approaches to improving participation, supporting increasing valuing and visibility, and ensuring that uh, female voice is at the table at every part of that decision-making process. We're making progress with our goals around governance and getting a much better and more equitable distribution of governors, but that continues to be a work in progress. COVID-19 cannot stop that kind of activity. So I'm proud of where we're at. I'm really excited about the opportunities of working with the IWG around how we take the lessons we're learning here, push them out uh, through the rest of the world and listen carefully to what the rest of the world has to say about how well they've done. I was very taken recently by a piece of work uh, that's been done by Holly Thorpe and Nita Ahmed here in New Zealand. And Holly, I'm sure you'll be on the call and hopefully Nita is as well, uh, around the role of Muslim women in sport. And it was a really interesting example of how when asked uh, the authors of the study, Holly and Nita, were asked what sports could do to support the participation of a 
perhaps traditionally underrepresented group in New Zealand sport, uh, they had three word, three phrases, show up, show up, show up. And I think that's important. We have to keep addressing and looking for the issues, the, the issues of intersectionality here, where we've got a, um, particular issues we all know about for women and girls in sport that take on different forms for Muslim women and girls in sport. But engaging with those communities, sporting organisations showing up to say, it's important to us to be truly inclusive, to have, provide a space and a place for all of those parts of our community is absolutely essential. So from my perspective, I'll keep showing up, listening to what's been said, and I really look forward to participating in the panel discussion uh, that follows on from this. But once again, congratulations to both the Business Circle, Whisper, and IWG for putting this event on, um, and you continue to have my full support. Nō reira, a tēnā koutou, a tēnā koutou, kia kaha, a tēnā koutou katoa. Well, kia ora, tēnā koutou katoa. It's Rachel Froggatt here, Secretary General of the International Working Group on Women in Sport. And of course, here in New Zealand, Chief Executive of Women in Sport Aotearoa, currently the delivery agency for the IWG Secretariat and World Conference from 2018 to 2022. First of all, an enormous welcome to the over 600 people that have registered to attend here live in person today and also to uh, receive the link afterwards if the, if the time zone is a bit unfriendly for you uh, to be able to watch this back afterwards. Um, here we're today launching the global campaign for the 8th IWG World Conference in Women in Sport, Change Inspires Change. And I think what you will have all just seen from Minister Robertson's address that Minister Robertson himself and the team at Sport New Zealand are an enormous part of the change that's inspiring change here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. We are incredibly proud and very privileged to have a Minister for Sport that is so unbelievably committed to women and girls in sport and physical activity, but wider than that, the inclusion of all people and the belief that everybody should have the opportunity to partake in whatever fashion they wish. So enormous thank you to Minister Robertson for your words today. I would also like to acknowledge Taiaha Hawk from Ngāti Whātua Aurake, who opened today's session with a beautiful mihi whakatau in Te Reo Māori. For those of you joining around the world, uh, that is an incredibly important part of our culture here in New Zealand. And Taiaha and Ngāti Whātua Aurake have been with us on the journey since October 2018 when we took over as host nation for the IWG. And in fact, Minister Robertson will remember this clearly. Uh, Ngāti Whātua and uh, the Minister welcomed our colleagues from Botswana here in Auckland nearly two years ago to hand the mantle over to New Zealand. So thank you, Taiaha. As has been mentioned, uh, our team at Trans Tasman Business Circle, we've been working with them for a long time, but I have to say the last 10 days have impressed me beyond belief because they have moved from essentially delivering a live physical lunch for 300 people at Eden Park, which is exactly where we're supposed to be right now, to a live digital lunch for 600 people around the world. So for 10 days, the turnaround from when our government announced no gatherings over 10 people in Auckland to being able to put this on today is extraordinary. So thank you to Sharon, to Tanya, to Johnny, to Dora, and especially to the epic Tracy Jennings, you are a monster. Today, we are launching the IWG World Conference. In May 2022, Tamaki Macaulay in Auckland will host the world. We will stage the world's largest independent gathering on gender equity in sport and physical activity. And as the minister so eloquently put, we are now, and we officially today, take our place as one of the big four. So the big four women's sports events coming to New Zealand in the next three years. And it's been an extraordinary privilege over the last year to get to know and to work with the teams from the Women's Cricket World Cup, the Women's Rugby World Cup, and of course the new team for the FIFA Women's World Cup coming up in 2023. So the team within the team has been developed across New Zealand with these four major events, and we are now what we are calling a global nexus for women's sport leadership around the world. 
So change inspires change. It's our new campaign. It's launching today. It's something that we are incredibly proud of. And the concept is really simple. Essentially, every change that you make, no matter how small, no matter how large, inspires the next and the next and the next. And that by sharing your story, you can inspire others to make positive change for women and girls as well. So this idea actually emerged from quite a few months of research, of discussion, of looking amongst our local organising committee here in New Zealand and then actually venturing abroad and in the process of developing Change Inspires Change we reached out to over 150 leaders, researchers and influencers from around the world and asked them what they were seeing, what they were experiencing and what they thought the future would bring for women and girls when it came to sport and physical activity. We realised really quickly that the IWG is the world's largest network um, of connected professionals working in the space of gender equity in sport and physical activity had a really unique opportunity. Essentially, we were in a unique position to recognise and to promote and to support the work of the thousands of people around the world who are working every single day in whatever capacity they can to make positive change for the full inclusion of women and girls in sport and physical activity. Now many of those thousands are actually here with us today and I hope many will watch back this launch and recognise themselves in that and know that what we wanted you to know is that your contribution, the things that you are doing, no matter how small they are, no matter how large they are, no matter how many people they reach, is really important and what you're doing is meaningful is what you're doing can inspire the next person and the next person and the next person and change can inspire change. I want to thank our fantastic agency here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, Bob's Your Uncle. They worked with us to distill down hundreds of stories, thoughts, ideas um, and, and insights that came from around the world into three words, change inspires change. And as was pointed out to me at the time, it's actually only two, two words because we use one word twice. So change inspires change. We could never have imagined that when we came up with this concept and when we agreed it at the end of January 2020, it would be only just over a month later that the biggest change almost any of us have ever seen in our lifetimes would, would, would take hold and COVID-19 would emerge as an enormous challenge in every single part of the life that we live today. And it's only through the really exceptional management of our government and our health officials here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, that life is actually somewhat normal here. You know, we, we actually continue to exist in a kind of new normal, but generally speaking, uh, we are so far so good managing the, the threat of COVID-19. However, we're extremely aware that around the world, not everybody is experiencing this. And in fact, if you look specifically at sport and physical activity, we can see that women and girls have been and continue to be disproportionately affected by COVID-19. And we've started to see, certainly in the initial stages, a stripping of funding and resource from women's sport around the world. And again, in New Zealand, we have been uh, in a very lucky position to have had government intervention and the work that Sport New Zealand and Minister Robertson have done very quickly put an end to that kind of behaviour in, in any part of our sector here in New Zealand and we continue to positively and constructively work with sports organisations and physical activities um, organisations here in New Zealand to make sure that women and girls are not left by the wayside as a result of COVID-19. So we could never have anticipated that change would inspire change and our local organising committee came back together after COVID-19 first struck. And we like to say we used lockdown well. So the first four weeks of lockdown where we were all at home uh, managing the threat of COVID, we got together and we looked at everything we had planned for the next two years around the IWG World Conference. And we looked at what we could take forward and we looked at what the change would inspire us to change within our thinking. So I'm thrilled today to announce three major initiatives. So the first one 
is that for the very first time in the history of the International Working Group, since the first conference was staged in 1994, we will in fact deliver the 8th IWG World Conference on Women in Sport as a physical digital hybrid. And that means that there will be a four day physical gathering here in Auckland and we will gather as many people as can safely gather with us and who can travel to New Zealand depending on their circumstances. And we will have an amazing event here live on the ground in Tamaki Makaura in Auckland. What we will also be doing is giving equal weight to the global virtual program. And this program will be run uh, at an international level through a technological hub, which I'll touch on in a moment. What's really important for people to know is that our virtual program will not just simply be a window to what's happening physically here on the ground in Auckland. Of course, it will physically overlap as much as we can and we'll make sure that our digital audiences and our physical audiences are working together and sharing their stories and contributing together. But we also know that a virtual program needs to stand on its own two feet and deliver real value around the world. So we're incredibly excited to be able to bring this initiative to you in, in May 2022. Secondly, we have always had a real passion and a real belief that the IWG World Conference is not a singular event that pops up every four years and disappears again. So what we are going to do and what we are beginning the process of doing from today is building what we, we think is a world first uh, hub, the IWG Insight Hub. And it's a technology hub that will become the home of the world's best research, insights, case studies, news, and interactive activities such as training, live seminars, and networking for the gender equity community worldwide to, to gather together and to communicate and share stories. We believe that as the network, as the connector between all of the, at the moment, six, just over 600 signatories to the Brighton plus Helsinki 2014 Declaration on Women in Sport, we believe that our role is to connect and enable and promote and share the amazing work that you are doing every day. So there is going to be an opportunity for you to share this via this Insight Hub, which we are now just working uh, with potential technology companies to start to build. So we're anticipating that this will come uh, online in sometime in early to mid 2021 and will be Aotearoa New Zealand's legacy for the IWG hosting and it will move forward to the next host nation at the end of 2022. And of course that hub will be the home for the virtual world conference. The final uh, initiative that we're launching today, which we're very excited about and will be supported by these two technology initiatives is to support and grow what we're calling a community of action. And what we're seeing around the world is this amazing set of work that's going on. And what we want to do, and, and we want to recognize this through our Change Inspires Change campaign, is to enable people to connect and grow and work together and to move across country boundaries, across organizational boundaries, across sport boundaries, across political boundaries, to share resources and ideas to move the entire gender equality movement forward. So you can join this community of action in its phase one uh, environment now at iwgwomeninsport.org. Um, at the moment, what we're going to be doing is collecting your stories through an online submission. And we're going to be promoting and sharing those across our website and our social media over the next little while. Those stories are then destined to live upon this IWG Insight Hub once this is launched. So you will see this, your story live for quite some time um, over the next two years as we journey towards the IWG World Conference. So I think I've spoken enough. And so at this point, I think uh, I've run out of words. So I'm going to let our film do the talking for us. So. Small changes can become great accomplishments. Joining from many sources, they flow together to create something mighty. Change inspires change. Each with its own story to tell. Stories shaped by people and people shaped by stories. By changing the way we look at things, the things we look at change. Creating champions who don't live by what's engraved in their trophies but by what's woven into the lives of others.
mamua ka kite amuri, mamuri ka ora amua. The International Working Group on Women in Sport has driven positive change for women and girls for more than 25 years. Aotearoa New Zealand, home to three upcoming Women's World Cups, will host our conference in May 2022. The largest gathering on gender equity in sport and physical activity in the world live in Auckland. Or follow the event virtually, collaborating with your international colleagues. You can also join our global community of action right now online. Mentor. Be mentored. Inspire. Be inspired. Sign up now to our tapestry of storytelling, woven with countless threads of change inspiring change. E hara taku toa i te toa takitahi. E ngari he toa takitini. Add your chapter to this story right now at iwgwomaninsport.org. Change inspires change. Thank you very much to our tech team for that uh, amazing uh, performance there. <laughs> so our new film, um, which we're incredibly proud of, is a collaboration between an enormous number of people that have helped us get to this point. So a very quick rundown. Thank you very much to uh, World Rugby and New Zealand Rugby, FIFA and New Zealand Football, the ICC and New Zealand Cricket. Also a thank you to the Helberg Foundation, Badminton New Zealand, Paralympics New Zealand, our amazing team at our agency, Bob's Your Uncle. And of course, you would have all taken on board that amazing voiceover from Pania Papa. Pania is a very well-known former athlete here in New Zealand. She was a silver fern netball player and she also um, is now a Te Reo Māori activist here in New Zealand and uh, a fantastic um, advocate for the language here uh, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So at this point, um, I'm going to move to hand over um, shortly to our live panel, which is going to be moderated by Melody Robinson, another former athlete who is an amazing uh, role model here for young women and girls here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Mel was a Black Ferns rugby player. She moved on to become a TV host and is now general manager of uh, events and sport at TVNZ. But before I hand to Mel, it's my great privilege to introduce our keynote speaker for today. For those of you living and working in the Australasian region, Raylene Castle is a towering figure uh, within sport leadership across the region. For the last 20 years, she has worked as Chief Executive of Netball New Zealand, the Bulldogs uh, in Australia, and most recently as Chief Executive of the Australian Rugby Union. And when we introduced the Change Inspires Change concept to her recently, she absolutely loved it. And she's actually recorded this special keynote for us. Unfortunately, she can't be with us live um, to really help us bring the concept to life. So I will hand over. Thank you very much for coming with us. I'd like to start with a video first. Um, I do apologise in advance. It is one from Rugby Australia, but it could be a it could be a video from anywhere uh, in community sport, and I think it just really captures some important messages around uh, the woman in sport movement, uh, and it's out of the mouth of a young girl who uh, probably didn't actually understand what she was saying, but it, uh, it is very relevant for today's conversation. I started when I was nine and I was the only girl playing. When under 12s finished, for me that was basically, I'm not playing football again until I'm 20 or so, because there was no girls competition. The head of the club, pushed and pushed and pushed to get us to have a team. Half the dads didn't like their daughters playing. So dad convinced all the dads and then I would convince other girls. Now we've got a team. They got us like new jerseys that are heaps good and they're not the boys, old jerseys like we used to wear. Girls, they're like my sisters. If you can't make the tackle, you can always trust the girl next to you to make the tackle. 
We're always up to get more points. Even if we're getting smashed, we won't give up. We're just going to keep fighting. With rugby, you like escape for the drama and cattiness from schoolgirls. You get to go out there and play rugby. It's nerve wracking, it's adrenaline rushes. It's a good feeling. <laughs> So I hope you uh, enjoyed the video. Uh, you can see that, um, and this joke didn't actually really go down that well in Australia as it does in New Zealand, but I know everyone in the room, if I called any of the females in the room a bush pig, um, it really wouldn't go down very well. She uh, was delighted that her team was called the bush pigs. She is really proud of the fact that she got to play footy, but I think the important messages that come out of that video, and, and she really did say them without realizing it, is that, um, she had, what she had was um, a sponsor. She had somebody who, one of the fathers who was prepared to get in behind the girls playing rugby and she actually talked about convincing her father that um, he, it was okay for her to play rugby and I think um, that's a really important uh, part of this message, um, having a, a sponsor for women's sport, for women in, in leadership, it doesn't matter what it is, having people that are looking to help you grow and develop your skills and capabilities. Um, she talked about her teammates always getting behind her and how she does it for the girls and it doesn't matter if someone can't get there they pick each other up and they drive each other forward and I think that's also a really important message about supporting each other and making sure we're putting a hand out uh, so that we can um, you know support each other into these what are at the moment even more challenging times but certainly as we talk about the growth and leadership opportunities that support be it from um, our fellow fellow females or be it from um, other um, senior people in the organisation is also a really important part. Um, and it was just the whole community feel of actually being together and what sport can do to bring um, a game together. So um, I, I really like that video. I think it captures the essence of what sport can do uh, in, inside a community, but also the learnings that you can take out of sport, um, be you um, 12 years of age uh, or be you um, 40 or 50 years of age. One of the things that the guys wanted me to ask me to talk about today was resilience and leadership. Uh, people often ask me, what is it specifically um, that you think is the number one requirement for leadership? And I have to say resilience is the word that continually springs to mind for me. Uh, and um, it is that underpinning presence on which you can lead through um, good times, um, but certainly helps you when you can lead through really difficult times. Uh, and I certainly, in my time here in Australia, have uh, generated and earned a lot of new battle scars, um, <laughs> some probably deeper than I planned. But the reality is that if you take an example like the Israel Flow issue, um, the resilience level that I needed to be able to work through that process where I had some very senior people throughout the Australian environment telling me I'd got it wrong, criticising um, a whole you know, newspaper consistently writing articles and opinion pieces about how wrong Rugby Australia had got it in its stance. And the reality of that is that we were very firm in our values. We were very clear that um, this was this um, uh, social media messaging was totally inappropriate. It was a breach of an employment contract. But it was also about the values that our organisation stood for. And unless you're actually prepared to stand up and back in those values and actually say yes, um, that's what um, we believe in and this is who we stand for as an organisation, um, then those values don't mean uh, what anything to anyone and they certainly are only as good as being written on the wall behind reception. So for us, that was an important um, stance that we took, uh, but the resilience required to make sure that we could um, work through what was a very difficult and long situation It went for about... 12 months at the end of the day and, and it was something that certainly for me uh, created um, another layer of resilience and, and a place that I can go to if, um, you know, times are tough for me. People also say to me, how um, do you deal with the social media conversation? I think, uh, you know, I had some very difficult times during that, uh, particularly with social media. I had death threats. Um, we had to close down the office and have extra security and my house had to be checked out to make sure that um, you know it was safe and that no one could get into it or find me um, and that's 
talking serious stuff. It's not it's not things that you expect that you'll find when you start in a role like this. Uh, but that was, um, you know, that, that was what I was facing. And, and people say to me, how do you deal with that? And I deal with it by having three or four trusted advisors. And if those trusted advisors tell me that I got it wrong and that I didn't um, handle that matter correctly, that's when I step up. That's when I have a sleepless night. Um, I don't read, read social media. I'm lucky to have someone who, who would give me a guide of what was happening you know, for a temperature check to understand what people were saying. But you really can't run your business through social media feedback. Otherwise, your strategy would be like that all over the place. So you have to be brave enough to say, this is it. This is what I'm doing and stick to it. Um, but certainly for me, those trusted advisors who help guide me and also give me some really clear and honest feedback um, are the people that help me through those difficult times. In relation to COVID and, and what it's doing for, for women's sport, uh, it is a very difficult time for all sport. It's not just women's sport, but it's incredibly difficult for all sport, be you in the professional part of the game, be you in the amateur part of the game. But as we've seen, we've seen a lot of organisations take uh, perhaps a different approach to, to women's organisation, uh, to women's sport rather than um, to the men's role. And I think that's a conversation that, that we need to have. But I feel very strongly that uh, women's sport holds um, an enormous future role uh, in, I mean, it has done in community for a long period of time. It has done in the Olympic movement. But as we move into the professional sport conversation and growing salaries um, and the professionalism of sport for women, uh, I have a very strong view that we need to get the pillars right. And those pillars underneath are ensuring that our female athletes have got the best possible coaching, world-class coaching, that they've got uh, athletic performance support, be that around strength and conditioning or mental skills or um, diet and nutrition, all of those things that our male athletes have had for a very long period of time. Um, those key pillars are the underpinning piece that will allow our female athletes to perform at the best possible way that they can um, in, as they move into this professional environment. And I think for female athletes also have to have a conversation around what is the best presentation for their game? How is their game and their skills presented uh, in the best possible way. And I know cricket um, you know, have made some um, great gains in making their, um, their sports uh, you know, incredibly successful, both commercially, but also when you had 90,000 people at the MCG for the final of the, of the women's um, uh, T20 cricket. Um, they have the boundaries in, they have a smaller ball, um, and it presents their sport in the best possible way that they can present it. That's an entertaining uh, commercial product that doesn't need to be compared to the men. And I think... That's something that our female athletes have to be open to, to think about the commerciality, to make sure they're presenting um, the sport in a great way. And if I take rugby, women's rugby sevens um, as another great example, they play the same game with the same rules, but they play it with their own style. It's much more free-flowing. Um, there's more tries scored. They don't get it as, as tied up in the ruck picks as the men do. Uh, but that's a, a product I was lucky to be at the Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast and to see a sold out stadium cheering equally as excited, if not I might say more excited for the women's product than they were for the men because it's just such a fantastic opportunity um, to present a product that uh, uh, really grows and develops. But I can't stress enough that um, we have to get the, the baseline right and make sure we're giving our female athletes the support that they need to be able to uh, have those base and key pillars to improve as quickly as they can. And once you give them those base pillars, that's when you see the commercial products start to um, improve the quality of the product, the viewing audience, and then for the sponsors and the commerciality will come. Uh, I, I know this is um, uh, you know, an important uh, step in the, in the new conference as we move forward. Um, I've really um, appreciated the opportunity to, to, opportunity to be part of it. Um, I wish you all well. I just want to say thanks to uh, Sharon and Rachel who allowed and organised everything here for me to be part of this. Um, I am sad that I'm not in the room and I won't be able to, to hear the panel who I know will um, you know, debate some of these issues and, and discussions that we've had so far in much more detail. Um, sorry I can't be there. Thanks very much for listening and I hope I get to catch you all soon. Thanks very much. See ya. Well, Kilda, uh, thank you so much uh, to Raylene Castle there, um, giving us, I guess, an insight into some of the challenges that she faced uh, as CEO, particularly of Australian rugby. So thank you very much, Raylene. Um, tēnā koutou katoa, hoki ora mai. That's hello to everybody and welcome. 
Uh, I see there's so many amazing guests on the invite list from all over the globe, so great to have you join us. Um, I hope today is inspiring you and perhaps giving you some tools to affect change wherever you are. So I'm Melody Robinson. Um, I'm super happy to be here with our guests because uh, personally what gets me out of bed every day is influencing in sports and media um, and making it a more equitable place uh, for women, uh, Māori and other people who are not beneficiaries of privilege. Um, but I'd like to get into our guests in the panel now and reintroduce to you the Honourable Grant Robertson. Um, he is a politician because he believes in social justice. He wants to see every New Zealander achieve their potential. Uh, that and also his passion for sports has led him to become the Minister of Sport and Recreation. Uh, he was a rugby player, a number eight no less. His partner Alf was his halfback in the same team. They now have a very large family which includes four grandchildren and they were joined in a civil union in 2009. Minister Robertson, it is great to have you here. I hope somebody got you some lunch. Oh uh, yeah, I, as you know Mel, I won't fade away, so it'll be all right. <laughs> Lovely. Our second guest is just as fantastic, her name is Hayley Putaranui. She is Māori, her iwi are Ngāti Mania Puto, Te Aitanga Ahawiti and Ngāti Pahawera. She is a rather big deal as one of the leaders at New Zealand's global dairy company Fonterra. She's head of D&I. She's achieved so much, including becoming a mum at 17 years old, yet still somehow finding the time to get a law degree, become a lawyer, and then move into Fonterra. And even more impressive than that is that in her spare time, as if she had any, she was a key person in leading uh, parts of her iwi settlement with the Crown. Welcome, Hayley. Uh, Hayley, there's a theme here. What sport do you play? Did you play? Kia ora, kia ora um, I played netball a very long time ago and not very well. So I quickly realised where my talents lay and where they didn't lay. And clearly I, I hit the books and let the netball court, uh, left that far behind. But thank you very, very much, Mel. Um, mihi to the Minister and Kia tata katoa joining us today. Much pleasure of mine to be here. And it doesn't matter, it matter if you don't get to our national teams. If you participate, that's really important as well. Okay, and we have to have a sports star uh, because they always have stories around resilience, overcoming adversity and changing stereotypes. She is Sophie Devine and she is a New Zealand superstar of cricket. She's regarded as one of the most powerful players in the world shown by how she smashed her maiden century against South Africa last season. And she became the first cricketer, male or female, to hit five consecutive 50 plus scores. She made the New Zealand team at 17 years old and she's also played hockey for New Zealand. Welcome, Sophie. Why did you pick cricket over hockey? Kia ora, Mel. Um, oh, look, at the end of the day, it was almost a flip of the coin. I, I was very fortunate to play both sports at the elite level at the same time, which is uh, pretty rare nowadays with the professionalism of the game. But the opportunities that arose in the, in the cricket environment was something that I couldn't turn down. Great, I understand. Uh, we'll start with um, Minister Robertson. Um, you're nearing the first term of the end of your Minister for Sport and Recreation. What have been some of the highlights for you and your portfolio so far? Oh, um, heaps. Um, I think, you know, just actually getting the strategy on women and girls in sport up and running is one of my big highlights. It, um, it's something that we developed after I came into office that, um, you know, we worked really hard to, to make it um, something that I don't think had been discussed properly at, at the highest levels of government in terms of sport. And so seeing that roll out, seeing the, you know, the fantastic work around coaching, around leadership, um, seeing the work that's coming through, particularly for, for young girls as well. Um, so that's been a real highlight for me. Um, along with that, um, the sort of boring technical stuff that politicians do, but we, we, got, we got going an initiative called Healthy Active Learning here in New Zealand, which is actually bringing together um, our health um, promotion folk with schools and with sport and actually putting all of those together um, in classroom-based uh, activities. Uh, unfortunately, COVID-19 got in the way for the full rollout of that, but finally breaking down some of those barriers and having sport at the table of those decisions and, and getting health and education to really, you know, see the value of sport alongside uh, what they're doing in, in, in the curriculum. So that that was a massive, been a massive highlight for me was actually making that happen. Um, then there's all the fantastic games that I get to go to. Um, and um, it has been, you know, there's been some really, really cool uh, events over this time. And I have to say just recently, uh, waking up when my alarm went off at four in the morning to tell me that, 
Australia and New Zealand had got the rights to host the 2023 FIFA Women's World Cup was a real highlight. Um, and I, you know, I sort of fumbled around, and dropped the phone, and it was about a minute past four, and then my phone started buzzing with with all the people who had actually done the same thing that I had. So, you know, I think we're in a really good place here. Um, COVID's had a massive effect on all of us and our daily lives, and so just making sure that sport and recreation makes it through that is really important to me. But we can't just make it through. We've also got to make sure that all of the um, you know, issues that we had on our plate, including those around women and girls in sport, keep going through this. So, yeah. So, no, looking forward to, uh, to the next period of time. Um, for those not from New Zealand, we have an election on uh, here uh, very soon. And so um, that's occupying a little bit of my time too. Yeah, it is indeed. Um, we'll get into um, the Q&As Q &As you're all sending through now. I can see a few of them popping up. I'll definitely uh, ask some of those questions through it. But I just want to start with uh, the topic of leadership. Um, we have three individuals who know plenty about that. And Sophie Devine in particular for you, um, just to lead you into this one by asking you, uh, you've been surrounded by uh, captains um, in different styles of leadership in your cricket career. Um, what, in your opinion, makes a good leader? Yeah, thanks, Mel. I think, firstly, can I just say a huge thank you to Rachel and Sharon from Business Circle and Whisper for inviting me along. When I first saw the list, I was extremely intimidated by some of the people that are here watching today, but I'm also um, very humbled and inspired to be a part of this. So thank you for having me on board. Um, secondly as well, I want to put this out there. I am a cricketer, I'm an athlete. I've got no corporate background whatsoever. So please bear with me if the language is a little bit different, but I think there's some really nice um, relations between the sporting and the the business world. Um, you're right, I've played with some fantastic leaders and I think Raylene actually mentioned one of the key words earlier in her video was around resilience and being able to go through the tough times and to, to bounce back and to have that consistency I think is something that I think is really important for any leader, it doesn't matter whether it is in the sporting world or in the business world, is to stay consistent with whatever your message, whatever your values are, you stay consistent to that I think is, is a real strength. Oh, nice. Um... And Hayley, in terms of leadership um, in the workplace um, and then going up into that executive management level, um, obviously there is a lack of diversity in many of those positions, um, even in countries like New Zealand, um, when we think of ourselves as quite, um, I don't know, proactive in those areas. One of the things uh, we often hear are comments, you know, we're going to hire or promote the best person for the job, regardless of gender or race. Um, how do you deal with that when you hear that? Yeah, I think to your point, so the world is evolving, society's evolving, and even in New Zealand, it's evolving at a pace. So I think I tend not to uh, counteract it personally. I um, typically let leaders themselves unpack that. And from statements like, you know, I, so they're talking about meritocracy or, or appointment on merit. And, it, you know, as you've said, that typically doesn't happen and it still hasn't happened and it's not good enough that in 2020 it is still not happening. But I let leaders evolve themselves. And it's going to be a conversation that people, and again, in particular, leaders can't opt out of because society is going to, force that and you want leaders actually to find their own way there but again they're going to have to do that at pace because society is going to you know is going to not only demand it but you want uh, DNI. I think it has tended to so diversity and inclusion has tended to be a kind of nice to have nice to do um, at Fonterra it's definitely part of our strategic you know our strategic values are at the way that we're going to deliver on all of the things that we espouse you got to make sure that you've got a culture that matches that as well so I actually, for me personally, it's not for me to, because I think those are quite loaded statements sometimes. Uh, leaders need to get their own heads around it. But I, but but you want to make it a little bit uncomfortable as well. So I don't shy, shy away from the uncomfortableness because you need that tension to get change. Otherwise, we're just going to get the continue. You know, we're not going to get change. So, you know, you, you um, I would like to think that as leadership evolves, uh, leaders look a little bit different to not just technical expertise, not just the most experienced or the loudest people in the room, 
uh, but they are actually people, people, and we've got a, you know, a shout out, and I'm, I'm probably, the minister will probably send me some lunch after this, but we've got a leader at the moment who has done that exact thing in terms of her leadership of our country. So not a medical expert, but has, you know, surrounded herself with a team of experts. And then the, the parts that have showed up is the ability to communicate, communicate that to the masses. And I think it's one example of leadership, but the face of leadership will change, but it's not going to be a, a, a option that you can, um, you know, leadership is not just about technical expertise and experience. It's going to be a whole lot of things, especially people investment. Ms. Minister Robertson, um, Jacinda Ardern and the style of leadership that she exhibits, could you tell us uh, what makes her so effective? <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty astounding to work alongside, to, you know, to be frank. Um, I know that you know, there's a few quotes that float around the internet from Jacinda around leadership, and I know that one of them talks about this idea that there's one form of good leadership is is such a false uh, thing that actually you've got to be true to who you are and the values that you bring, and that usually and often will bring people along. Um, Jacinda's tough, you know, she's tough in terms of the resilience factor that, that Sophie mentioned before, but also just she's you know she's tough on the other ministers. You know she has very high expectations of us, and you know expects us to show up and and know what we're talking about and and be ready to defend uh, uh, what we've got. But I think um, she manages to combine that toughness with an extraordinary intellect. Um, you know you talk about surrounding yourself with experts. You know her ability to you can't communicate the way Jacinda does without understanding what you're talking about. And so therefore she's absorbed this, all of this scientific and health information and uses the skill she has as a communicator to then turn that into messages that people can, can understand. And I also think um, empathy is the other great um, um, attribute that she has. And, and that means so much in leadership. You, do, you need to be able to understand, I think, the people around you, the people you're trying to influence, um, the people you know you need to bring with you. And if, if you can bring, you know, combining together that intellect, that toughness, and that empathy, I just think that is what, what makes her an extraordinary leader. But it's a very different leadership style. And I, you know, being frank, I think there's quite a few men um, in New Zealand who perhaps don't quite get it. <laughs> um, um, but I think they're getting it more as they see the, see the results from it. But uh, I just think it's about being true to yourself as well. And what you see with Jacinda is 100% what you get um, off camera as on camera. Um, Sophie, um, I think in the leadership um, description that Minister Robinson just had, it talked about empathy uh, when you're a leader. For team captains, it's often about high performance as well and winning. So, you know, how do you get to be a captain who is able to, to balance winning and then that leadership style? Yeah, again, it's, it's such a unique thing. I think we're captains of sports teams fall into some traps is where they try and be someone else exactly as minister just said is you try and be someone else and it's the same when you're playing a sport as well as you look up to people and it's great that you have role models but again you've got to go back to what your strengths are and, and what works for you and for me it's probably taken a long time to develop I guess a leadership style um, I think we're so blessed here in New Zealand that we've got so many fantastic leaders and particularly female leaders um, so for me, it is, it's about uh, supporting the whole person. I think at, at the end of the day, we're all people here and that absolutely, we, when we're playing at the highest level, we want to win. That, that's why we're there and, and that's, that's our job is, is to win games of, of cricket for us. But we also um, yeah, have that human element to us as well. So for me, it is about understanding the person and how can I get the best out of my teammate, and it might be about how I communicate with them. Um, someone might need a bit of a rev up, might need a bit more energy to, to spark them up, whereas someone might just want a quiet word before we go onto the field. So that knowledge of your teammates and that empathy, I think, is a great word. Um, it's something that I think is so important for, for any captain and how they want to use it is, is really important too. I've got to unmute it first. <laughs> I've got a question that's, that has been sent through from Uruguay. Um, it's how do uh, continents and countries, um, how can they help in their movements to support sport girls and women's football? And I, I guess this might be um, a general one for you, Minister Robertson. Um, when countries aren't as developed uh, as New Zealand is in terms of our 
support of women's sport, what advice would you give may, maybe an African country and the female participants there to try and influence to get support for women's sport? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm all, I always hesitate in those sort of situations when you don't know everything about a country to be able to give that kind of advice. Uh, I mean, maybe I can draw on sort of part of my background. So prior to politics and all of this, one of the roles I had was managing New Zealand's overseas aid program in Samoa. And we were looking at a number of, of different initiatives up there supporting uh, different um, parts of, of society. And we had a particular stream around women's empowerment. And we brought people up from New Zealand to help do some of the training and so on and so forth. And it became clear really, really quickly that there were things that we actually just, we were trying to put in place that worked in New Zealand that actually just did not work there. And I remember one example was a, a, a woman in business group that we were supporting and um, they were selling some of their products on the side of the road. And what was happening was that the the uh, people from some of the churches that they belonged to were arriving and saying, oh, right, can we now have a donation? And they were losing quite a lot of the money that they were making quite quickly. And, and you know, there was sort of a lot of outrage from, from the New Zealanders who were there. And it was actually some of the locals who said to us, well, this is part and parcel of what it means to live in this society. Perhaps we should think of another way. By the way, the solution we came up with was that a mobile banker went around earlier in the day and got the profits so there were, it wasn't as much money there. But it was about just recognising that there are different um, ways of getting to the same point, not imposing necessarily those values from outside, but understanding um, what the barriers are and then working on those. And I mentioned in my opening comments the work that Holly and, and Nader are doing here in New Zealand around Muslim women and their participation in sport. And it was really interesting that the barriers were similar to the ones that, you know, we would think about like transport, you know, resources, but also just that feeling of being excluded. So I guess my advice would be to say, make it work in the community you've got if you know what your goal is. We saw in the Raylene's video, the young woman, you know, finding the champion, finding the champion that worked in her community to drive it forward. So, you know, I'm always reluctant to give that advice, but I think that, I think that people will know their own communities, have a really clear goal, find champions to support that goal. And, and you know, there's always a workaround, there's always a way through. Cool, great, thank you, um, Mr. Robertson. Um, Hayley, I want to come to you in a second, but I've got this question from Michelle Hooper, who's obviously um, involved in the Women's Rugby World Cup organisation for next year. Um, she's asking, from Sophie's experience, what is the most effective message she would share with young girls who would want to follow in her footsteps? What empowers them the most? That's another great question. Um, I think for me, I've I've always been so fortunate that I've always had opportunity to play sport and I've never had um, any barriers that have held me back. And, and I have been very lucky. I've also always had fantastic support from my parents, from my community. And there was never a, oh, you can't play that because that's not for girls or, oh, I'm not sure if that's for you. So I think I'd certainly encourage any young female, any young person to be fair, is to try and explore all the options that are out there for them. Because I think, um, that sort of ties in a little bit to knowing yourself and into being yourself too is, is there's so many amazing sports out there at the moment is yeah is explore and don't be scared to try things that um you know some people might not think is is the norm so yeah hopefully that's answered the question yep that's great um Hayley, I'm, I'm quite interested um in terms of your inclusion policy uh, where you work um what does it look like how have you um, formed it when you know that you'll have uh, sceptics or doubters of why we hire for diversity and inclusion reasons? Um, yeah, I think, um, so we at Frontier, we've had, we've sort of um, had a diversity and inclusion um, workspace and focus for since about 2018. And I think it um, has been it's quite similar to everyone else as society sort of has this conversations and, and gets used to um, talking about things that haven't typically been spoken about for a long time. So at this point in time, I think we've evolved to the point of we're definitely 
Um, so putting the inclusion first and thinking around and deliberately thinking of inclusion as our strategic advantage because I think that you cannot have diversity. You have to have that inclusion place for diversity to thrive. And so um, I think whether you have tended to categorize diversity, so put people into boxes, so you know, sexuality and gender, um, ethnicity, those have tended to be the headline acts. And for, for whatever reason, it might be human nature, other things have dropped away. I think that we have moved on from that and I'd like to think we're ahead of the curve as well. So, um, you know, irrespective of where you fit uh, in that, I think inclusion is the piece. And so that is our focus. We have um, principles around whanaunga tanga, kaitiaki tanga, manaki tanga. Um, so while those are articulated in, in, in te reo, um, the extension from that is, is you know, more tato, more aotearoa. So again, I think our place in this whole piece is to really normalise conversations. And again, there'll be some tension, there'll be some challenges but that's all part of it again because we are not going to get change if we are all still sitting comfortably but it has to be genuine change as well and, and there's an accountability piece so hold a mirror up to yourself as a leader check yourself on your patterns you know what is your, your, your typical patterns who is in your circles are you looking for information that will kind of confirm your existing view and therefore you know well great I'm still you know in my view I'm still hiring the same person I think there's an element of if you do have a platform sometimes it's appropriate to give up your airtime. So it's great that you're an ally and it's great that you've got an interpretation or you've got a view. How about listen to the very people that are in those positions? So just give up the airtime. And sometimes that's quite hard as well, like just to put it on mute and say, you know, and give up your airtime to someone else to say, actually, what do you think? Or actually, what happens to you in your view? Again, this doesn't mean that you're not well-intentioned or that you're not a good person. It just means that there should be, there are other voices in the room. So our inclusion, our focus on inclusion, articulated in te reo, but it's also very much about, let's get things right at home. Um, because, you know, it, it, our business is largely an export business. Um, and all of our people, no matter where they are, if you think about our farmers who are, you know, right at the heart of so closely connected to um, the land, our workforce, our global workforce and our consumers and our customers, irrespective of where you fit in, every single person has a place, but it takes all of us as well to form what inclusion looks like and feels like. And I think kind of moving, moving on from sort of corporate branding and actually asking people to articulate it in the most simplest and plain language, that works as well. So great answer, thank you, Hayley. Um, just a heads up that uh, Minister Robertson will be leaving at 1.50, um, but I've got a really um, fantastic question for you here, um, Miss Minister Robertson. It is Raylene Castle, thoughts on her for next CEO of Sport NZ? Yes, so um, for those who, who can't see, uh, this question was actually put by uh, a fellow journalist um, of Mel's, um, and uh, the answer I've already given to uh, Michelle in the chat is that um, that's a decision for the board of Sport New Zealand. I don't get directly involved in that appointment. What I did go on to say, though, is that I've got huge admiration for Raylene. I think the, what, what she's done as an administrator in sport has been exceptional, extraordinary. And she's had to do that in male-dominated sports. And dare I say it, not wanting to upset trans-Tasman relations on the trans-Tasman business circle lunch, but in, a, in the Australian sporting environment, which from the outside looks even more brutal than, um, than some of what happens on the field. So, you know, I've got huge admiration for Aileen and I'm, I'm you know, we want to keep, her and I actually had a chat recently um, when she came back and just around some issues and I want to keep working with her. But uh, no, Michelle doesn't get the scoop out of uh, this uh, out of this thing because it's not my job to do the appointment. And answered like a politician. I love it. Um, <laughs> Sophie, um, what are your thoughts on the commercialisation of sport in schools, um, which is currently in the sport spotlight, um, but from a women's sport point of view? Yeah, it's a really concerning thing to me, actually. I, I, I work closely with actually a, a Sport New Zealand pilot program called Balance is Better. Um, and it's all about, I guess, the specialisation in sport for youngsters, um, particularly in, in females as well. As Like I mentioned earlier, I was so fortunate that I was able to play an array of sports. And I certainly think that that has helped me get to the level that I've been able to get to is because I had the opportunity to play different sports, learn new skills that have helped me now, I guess, hone my art, my craft more so. So, um, yeah, commercialisation of it, I think it's a really tough one because 
in this world, we know that, that money certainly helps um, fund programs, um, like Rayleigh mentioned, in terms of if having resources, whether it's strength and conditioning, health and nutrition, it, it does play a part in it. But I think there's got to be a point where we've got to let kids be kids and we've got to let them um, get to a certain point where they can just enjoy sport for what it is. If they're going to be absolute superstars, they're going to be superstars. I think that'll happen naturally. We don't need to try and grab them when they're 10 years old. And I think, it, you know, there's some incredible statistics out there about these academies that are starting up for, you know, under eights, under nines, under tens. And I sort of look at it and think, I've never seen a nine-year-old all black or I've never seen a, you know, a seven-year-old football firm play before. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty concerning for me, but um, hopefully we can have these conversations about it and get it out there. Mel, what, yes. what do you think about it? I'd be really interested to know what you actually think as someone who's got the broadcast and the sport background. Yeah, look, I, I think it's up to the parents. And um, from a female perspective, we really wanted our sport to be visible. So I would often find or hear even now that young girls just want to be seen playing because what it does is it impacts on changing, um, I guess, the viewpoint around women's sport, that it's a great product, um, that it is commercialisable. So it really has to be up to the parents to make the decision. And I think in the current circumstance, um, they can make the decision of whether or not uh, their schools, um, sports, um, or teams, or individual athletes uh, want to be involved in the, in the ones that have been televised. So um, it's a really tough one. Um, pure commercialisation of school kids' sport is is tricky because you really want to look after them uh, as well. But then first 15 teams, all of them want to be on telly because that offers them another pathway through professional sports. So, um, yeah. You've landed me in um, a very tough place there to answer that. <laughs> Hayley, I've got another one. Answered like a politician. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hayley, um, what's your advice for women who are struggling to achieve administration opportunities in a male-dominated sports organisation? And how can this forum, um, particularly IWG, influence male-dominated sports organisations? Yeah, again, I think it's um, just, look, I... I do have some, you know, I, I even have some tough crowds, right? And I have, uh, as recently as last week, I had um, one of our senior leaders say to us, well, you know, he really grapples with the issue of when women, you know, make the choice to have children. And I was sort of like, well, let's just check that language because um, we can't, it's actually not a choice. The anatomy dictates that as much for men as, as for women. So I think... Um, try and always, rather than kind of make taking an, an abrasive approach, because I think typically that can be quite an easy and again um, create some tension and create some challenge but come at it with quite a solutions and I think sometimes um, that whole solutions mindset is a little bit overplay find your allies allies so go out and find your people I again typically um, as a Māori woman feel quite I, I can sometimes just feel I just need some people right and, and Mel you'll know this as well you just need some some peeps to just just to bounce things around so go out and find your allies um, and be very deliberate about that because, again, this will evolve. So the best leaders will get their heads around how they bring themselves up to speed. But just be very clear on what lane you are trying to be in as well. Some of us, I think, have a tendency to, to want to get into 10 lanes. I'm very clear around um, leadership when I'm working with leaders. It's actually not for me to fill their kete up or give them the answers. So to your question around, you know, most people will say, um, well, look, I just want the person, best person for the job. And I'm like, great, so do I. And then, you know, there's this quite kind of awkward silence around, well, well, I thought we were going to have a scrap about it. I'm like, well, no, I'm not here to have, you know, that's actually not my place. So I think two pieces of advice for me, find your allies and stick with them, but actually change and challenge, but do, do it in, in a, you know, in a partnership sense. Um, and again, just be very clear on your lane, because again, with DNI being so massive, I potentially, you know, I get myself into this rabbit hole of wanting to save the whole world. Um, I think I'm great, but I'm not that good. So um, just be very clear on your lane and be very clear. Sometimes, again, um, it, timing is really key as well. So take people on the journey with you and just make sure that you're bringing, doing it in a way that you are taking people alongside you rather than because you can become an outlier. And that's often quite quite hard as well um, but be very clear on sometimes as well the reality is is don't do this stuff because you want to be liked 
because you want to be popular uh, because typically you will come short most of the time as well and that's typically not a measure for me that I bother with because um, you've just got to again go out and find your lane and your people and be very clear um, be be very very clear on what what in fact it is that you're trying to achieve and what you're trying to challenge and keep that small sometimes nice now this is a really tricky um question um to answer so uh, the question is what needs to be done to address the issue of bullying in women's sport but i guess if we change the question a little bit more to um the high performance sport uh, model um some athletes really uh, do well um, in the model that we have and others struggle. Um, Minister Robertson, is there any thought around where we go in the future with this high performance sport model? Yeah, it's the subject of a lot of conversation and I think you've articulated one of the really uh, critical aspects of it well. You know, high performance athletes, uh, you used the phrase before, are, are there to win. They're there to compete and they're there, you know, to achieve their best. And that environment automatically becomes a, a heightened environment in a lot of different ways. And uh, what that can't excuse, though, is creating unsafe environments, creating um, intimidating environments. Those boundary lines need to be set really clearly at the beginning and understood. And different coaches will have different styles, different athletes will react to different coaches in different ways. That makes it tough. But I think one of the things we've got to be thinking about now in that high performance environment is what we're recognizing in all parts of society, and, and Haley will be all over this, I'm sure, at Fonterra, is that we're much better nowadays at recognizing the whole person as part of of what we do, you know, and that you want the best out of a, an athlete or, a, or an executive is that you've got to recognize their whole person, you know, what, what are the things that keep them mentally well, what's, what's happening in their whanau that you know you could provide a different way of supporting. That, that's trickier than it was when it was just dictated and done. And so working at that and having it really clearly understood from the beginning and having checks through the process that it's still happening uh, and, and, and forums for grievances to be aired and, and dealt with in a way that's really powerful for the people involved is important. So this is a big issue at the moment in sport. There's a whole other issue which I see has come up in the questions too around the funding formula and that's been worked on as well. But in terms of making sure that we create those safe environments that are enabling people to achieve to their maximum potential, I think it's you know core communication, getting it agreed at the start, having processes to work through it. I think every sport is now understands the need to do it, but there's a lot of work to do for all of us to support that process. But, you know, I feel like Sophie in particular will have a lot, a lot more than I can probably add on that. Sophie? Yeah, I think it's really important. I think about um, our cricket environment. I think we're really fortunate that we've got an uh, independent representation with our Players Association, which I think is a massive uh, positive for us as players. And, and being able to air grievances I think is a really important thing and, and having that players association as a, I guess, a stepping stone to New Zealand cricket, who we've got a fantastic relationship with and it's because we're able to have these discussions and we can air grievances without any fear of repercussions because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether you're in a sports team or in the business world is everyone just wants to feel safe in their environment. I think that's really important. So for us, the, the role that the players association plays for us is so crucial and we are, we're really fortunate that we've got a fantastic PD program and Minister, you mentioned about supporting the whole person and that is certainly something that is really focused on, I think, particularly in the tough times that we're facing at the moment is mental well-being is, is huge and we've got such fantastic support for that because we know if people are happy off the field, generally they're going to perform on it. So again, I just think we're really fortunate and, I, and I'd urge all sports to try and find that, that independent voice um, to help players you know, feel, feel comfortable to raise any issues, good and bad. Yes, and um, I know Heath Mills is with the players. So, and is that you, um, Minister Robertson? You're gone? Yes, one for yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a real pleasure having you here. Um, yeah, ka kite uh, ano, and um, really enjoyed that session, and I'll, I'll go back and watch the last few minutes a bit later on, but thanks, oh, everybody. Thank you. Thanks so much.
We've got another couple of minutes. Um, and Hayley, there's a, a lovely um, comment here from Sally Short here. Enjoying Hayley's description of allies rather than sponsors or champions and implies a collaborative rather than hierarchical support. So um, yeah, that was just a comment for you. And I also think this one might be one you can answer. Can the professionalism and commercialization and hero, heroism and profile of female sport and athletes be a leading edge for general social change and improvement for women? women. Um, and the comment is social change despite legal equality in New Zealand is glacial. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, th I think that's, that's, you know, people talk about their why, but I think that's for me, um, you know, I talked about uncomfortableness, I talked about t uh, tension, I'm deliberate in all of the sessions that I run at, um, you know, in my day job, because again, you want that to be, and, and again, leadership, um, this con conversation for leadership, so, you know, um, traversing this uncomfortableness, um, it's it's a well that it's well overdue conversations, um, but society will demand it because we're moving at a pace, right? You know, um, Black Lives Matter for the in the US context that came, uh, uh, you know, and we would like to think that we're relatively sheltered down here, but I actually don't think, um, you know, that we 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 are in in so far as we might think we are. My point is. Um, it's just these conversations in society is moving with such pace, particularly with technology, right? So there, there's no hiding from this stuff. Um, and I definitely think, so I think in for business anyway, um, I would like to think that business, um, you know, we, we, we don't sit, sit complicit uh, in some of these things as well. And I think complicit sometimes it by silence. And so we tend to sit silent and we'll get caught out eventually. Or we will also get caught out because the, the values that we uh, we might be espousing in our um, brand uh, could well be, be at, odd, at odds for the lived experiences of our people. And again, um, we've got to get that right as well because um, there are way too many opportunities for people. You, you know, DNI is a strategic advantage in terms of attraction, recruitment, and why people why you keep people. Um, and I think that the analogy or the context that you gave in the question is exactly at that because as society changes, it moves at pace, you know, the face of Aotearoa, for example, is going to change and not too far away, we're going to have a minority majority of people, um, you know, Māori, Pacific, uh, Indian, Chinese, you know, again, but I think it's an exciting opportunity and I think that leaders, the faster that they get their heads around it and they lead it, I, I think it'll become a mark of excellence to be at this pace of change and I think it's an opportunity and a really exciting time for all of us, wherever you work and play. Um, thank you so much. I just want to uh, apologise to the last um, few questions on there that we didn't get to. Um, but just to finish off with Sophie and Hayley, um, what is the one passion that gets you out of bed every single day? Hayley, you go. Oh, um, oh, look, I think, again, whether or not it's, um, you know, my, I've got uh, a little niece, so she's six. Um, she goes to a Kurakaupapa kura Māori. Um, she, I want her world to be absolutely whatever she wants it to be. I have a 23-year-old as well that played basketball in the state. She's just come back. Um, she clearly did not get her hype from her mother, by the way. Um, yeah. But, you know, I want them to be whatever the heck they want to be. And sometimes when, I'm, when I talk about these tough conversations that I have, I just think the thing about it is, you know, like you either have this conversation with me in a safe room or you can work, walk out because you are soon going to, be, going to become redundant. And that's a good thing. Um, so what we want uh, as a mark of excellence are people that are very comfortable with the uncomfortable. Um, because from there, that's where we'll get, we, we, where we'll get tomorrow. And I would just encourage everyone um, to quickly, by the end of this day, I'd like everyone, we'll go, you go Google it or um, ask the young people in your house what um, woke washing means, what cancel culture means, what gaslighting means, those three terms. Um, and if you haven't heard of them, make yourself aware of them. Go go and Google them. Go and ask the young people in your room, in, uh, uh, sorry, in your households, because again, this is moving at pace and I want you to be able to speak with some uh, affirmation that you are onto it, but also you're comfortable with the uncomfortableness. Awesome. Love it. And Sophie, to finish off? Oh, I love yeah, I think for me, it's just inspiring the next generation. I think the opportunities for females are a lot more now than when I first started. And I think about in our cricket environment, when I first started, there were no contracts. We're now up to 60 plus contracts for female cricketers in the world. And I'd love to think in 10, 15, 20 years time, 
we're talking about athletes as cricketers. We're not talking about female cricketers or male cricketers. It's just an athlete. It's just a player. It's not having to be, you know, male or female. And I think we've made some great steps, but I think we've got a long way to go yet. Yeah, absolutely. Um, to the two of you, um, thank you so much. Uh, I certainly learnt a lot from uh, the answers that you shared with us today. Hayley and Sophie, um, have a great day, Mum Mahi. Um, and also just a big thank you to, uh, to Sport NZ and the AT, um, the major partners, uh, to get this underway for Whisper and also Trans Tasman Business Circle. We really appreciate that. And of course, that is goodbye from myself. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and to wrap up the learnings and, and what we've all been here for today, uh, here is the Honourable Patricia Forsyth, the Australian High Commissioner to New Zealand. Thanks, Mel. And kia ora, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, I would just want to wrap up today with a couple of words uh, around the theme of change inspires change. Because back in October 2016, I was on the board of Cricket New South Wales, and we work with our sponsor, to be able to put in place the first female team contract that enabled all of the breakers in New South Wales to be fully professional. And a uh, consequence of that was that we, as um, all the rest of cricket in Australia, had to follow suit. But other codes picked up on that as well. And the, the notion then of change inspires change very much was embodied in that first professional contract. But of course, there was so much more from that. Um, it lifted the standard um, because the, the women could uh, practice all of the time. And not surprisingly, um, as the depth of cricket became more obvious for sponsors, sponsorship rose and media interest rose. And as the minister said earlier, or as Raylene mentioned as well, um, in March 8th this year, 86,174 people were at the MCG to watch Australia and India play in the T20 World Cup final. Now, that didn't happen by accident, but it was part of just where um, cricket and women um, have reached in just a very short time. So as I wrap up, I just want to reflect on the fact that as we move forward um, from this COVID time, I think one of the great challenges, and I'm glad we've got the business circle here, is that the marketing dollar for sport is going to be depleted. And the big challenge is that women's sport has going to have to work really hard to get in front of business to get their share of the dollar. We've shown what can be done when it, when it works well, when it happens. Um, and cricket is a really good example, but other codes now, of course, have picked up on that as well. So I think that's going to be the challenge. You know, in 2017, only 8% of sponsorship dollar in Australia went to women's sport. That can't be where we are into the future. And I certainly wish the IWG and, uh, and the work that it's going to do around change, inspiring change. There are great stories. We've heard many of them today. Um, I wish them well. I think the only thing missing today is the networking that we'd have, have with this. And I'm delighted to be part of it. I'm going to invite for the formal close, Taihara to uh, give that formal close. Thanks everybody. Change inspires change. Kei te tau whiro whiro te marama a kutoku oho oho tērā. Kei te huri te tai a hine moana a kutoku hiringa tērā. Nā reira, kei oku puna mā tauranga, kei oku puna roimata. E kau taurā ngā uri o hine te iwa iwa, a nei rā kamehi ake. Ah, kia tau nei ngā tau whiro tanga a i ho ngā mano a ki runga e ngā hia hia ngā wawata ngā moi moi a kei rotaku kai whaka oho oho a kei aku manu ngā ngāhu Ai, ko te tuara o tiwi a ko ngā wahine 
a ko te oranga tonu itanga a o ngā mā tauranga a papatua anuku kai roto i a tātou kohine. Nā reira ko tēnei a Ngāti Whātua, mihi nei, tangi nei ki a koutou, a kia pakari ai tēnei kaupapa, a kia whakaranga tira ai koutou, a wahine me a tātou tai tama wahine, a nei. E, e koutou rā, taku kōrero whakamutunga ki a koutou, nau mai, hara mai, a uh, ki aotea roa nei hei te tau a uh, rua a uh, rua te kau rua te kau mā rua kia tai mai koutou ki runga i a Ngāti Whātua a uh, ki runga i tōku tūpuna whare a uh, tumutumu whenua ki runga i tōku nei marae o rā kei i riora e mihi nei e tangi nei ki a, tau, ki a koutou katoa paua ki a tina, tina haumia hui e yeah. Bye, yeah.